Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Boone, and I'm the marketing manager here at NSF. I wanted to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, where the speakers are going to discuss the topic of internal auditing. I'd like to first introduce you to today's speakers. We have Mr. Don McFarlane. Don was born into aerospace at the U.S. Air Force Academy Hospital and has been around ever since. He's been involved in third-party auditing for over 10 years and with NSF for the past three years. Currently, he serves as technical manager for the aerospace division. Mr. Mike McRandall is the business unit manager here for the NSF ISR Aerospace Group. Mike grew up in the aerospace and defense sector, working with fixed wing and rotator aircraft before moving into missile defense and sensor systems. He transitioned to the certification body side about six years ago and has been with us ever since. Just a few details to mention about today's webinar. During the webinar, I'm going to have everybody placed on mute. If you have any questions at all, please use the chat function. If you have questions for the speakers, please, like I said, use the chat function and we will go through those questions at the end of the webinar session for a little bit of a Q&A. Um, feel free to enter questions into there as, as you wish. Um, everybody that has registered for the event will be receiving an email with a full presentation recording as well as the slides, uh, a PDF copy of the slides. So no fear if you miss any part of the webinar today, you will be sent this information in full after within a week of the webinar. So with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Don and he can get started with the webinar. Perfect. Thanks, Katie, as always. Um, welcome, everybody, on this, uh, I guess it's a Tuesday now, Tuesday afternoon when we're recording this. Um, wanted to, uh, as typical with our webinars, start off with a poll question. And as this is related to the topic of internal audits, we want to ask one related to your internal audit program. So if you would, tell us, how often do you perform internal audits at your organization? We'll give everybody just a few seconds here to tick the, the appropriate box for your company. It's a pretty good return there. So. We'll go five seconds more. Five, four, three, two, and one. Perfect. Thank you very much. Overwhelmingly, annual audits are the, the quote unquote norm um, with the tie between the monthly and semi annuals. So you can see varying frequencies at which audits are being conducted. Now, I'm going to ask an even more direct question. Um, how much value do you see from your internal audit program? And please, this is an anonymous thing, so feel free to be brutally honest. Give everybody just a few more seconds. These results are warming my heart. Five seconds, five. Four, three, two, and one. So overwhelming majority said absolutely they're valuable. Um, you know, and that, that surprises me a little bit. I bet if we asked some folks in your organization, I believe they'd say the top one because they don't truly understand the uh, value of the internal audit program. Uh, as we're probably a, a majority of quality professionals in this, in this session, um, I think we all see the value in the internal audit program and understand the need and the necessity for driving this program uh, forward. So with that, we'll get into um, our subject a little bit more. Uh, it's important to know, and this, this quote just absolutely has stuck with me for a long time, internal auditors are the eyes and ears of management. Uh, it's important that they're not deaf and blind. Um, as we know, this is the tool that we're using for uh, our internal audit, or excuse me, our, our oversight of our system for ensuring that we're using our system to its capability, to its potential. And if we are not um, taking an honest and objective and unbiased look and really calling a spade a spade, we're not gaining anything out of our internal audit program. 
So we certainly, certainly need to make sure that we are auditing and doing it in a way that it's truly adding value to our organization and that we're not turning a, a blind eye, that we're not putting people in a position where they're not identifying things that are problematic or troublesome. So we'll talk about how to do that a little bit through this session. Uh, first, we're going to start with our transition plan benchmarks. And then we'll get into some of the definitions from the standard, uh, some implementation thoughts, and then some commentary or summary associated with that. And then we'll follow up with that Q&A session. And as Katie mentioned, if you've got some questions that come up through the, uh, through the session, please type them into that chat function. We'll flag those as questions, and then we'll go through and uh, review those towards the end of the end of the session here. So with that, we're going to get started in the transition plan. This is my monthly reminder that we're almost there. We're almost done. Um, if you don't have your audit scheduled, please, please, please reach out to your account manager. If you um, have scheduled it and haven't completed it, remember we're getting very close. You need to make sure that your corrective actions get done well in advance of the 915 date. If you've already completed it and you've transitioned, uh, time to sit back and sip on your favorite drink for a few months um, or fight the fires that have come up since then. So um, that deadline is quickly approaching. We're, we're inside of um, two months now to go until the uh, transition is completed. So hopefully everybody's moving along quite nicely. Uh, the next section is regarding the internal auditor definitions. Uh, or the standard citations. And I've got just a couple here because really the standard does not talk a whole lot about the internal audit program. Um, really it's boiled down to two clauses and then a reporting section through the management review. So we'll go through these two, two clauses here. And when I say two clauses, I mean 921 and 922. Uh, so within 921 says the organization shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to provide information on whether the QMS conforms to the organization's requirements for its QMS and the requirements of the international standard. So we have to make sure that it conforms to both the, our requirements, the requirements of our organization, and to the requirements of the AS ISO document. Okay? not only do we have to make sure that it conforms, we've got to make sure that it's working, that it's implemented and it maintains. So we somehow have to review what we're doing to make sure that it meets the needs of our customers and that it's doing what it says or doing what it's supposed to be doing and that we're doing the right things, that the output of that audit, um, or excuse me, the output of the, the execution is meeting customer needs, whether they're internal, internal or external um, the notes that are cited there says the organization's own requirements should include customer and applicable statutory and regulatory QMS requirements. As we know, throughout the standard, it has embedded the need for us to meet customer and applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. So it's just reminding us through the internal audit process that not only do we have to assess against our uh, process documents, but if there's specific requirements, say the FAA, we need to make sure that we're assessing those as part of our uh, internal audit program. Um, when conducting internal audits, sorry, this is the note down here, when conducting internal audits, performance indicators can be evaluated to determine whether the QMS is effectively implemented and maintained. So as I mentioned, we're going to ensure that it conforms. We're gonna make sure that it's implemented. And that really is, are we doing the, uh, things correctly? Are we executing our procedures? Are we following the, the age-old ISO adage of do what you say, say what you do? Um, the other half of this is to make sure that it's working, right? That it's effective. So that's where the, the metrics, the performance indicators come in to tell us whether or not it's effectively implemented and maintained, whether we're doing the correct things as a part of that process. Okay. So the next slide here is 922, clause 922, and it says we're going to plan, establish, implement, and maintain an audit program or programs, including the frequency, methods, responsibilities, planning requirements, and reporting. 
And all of this needs to take into consideration the importance of the processes concerned, the changes affecting the organization, and the results of previous audits. So we're going to digest that particular uh, clause, that particular section, in a lot more detail later on. So I'm going to skip over it for now. Um, we'll go into letter B. It says define the audit criteria and scope for each audit. So somewhere we need to define what we're auditing against, and the term criteria is meant to mean or is defined as the standard. So whether it's the FAA Part 145, whether it's uh, AS 9100, whether it's our quality manual or a combination thereof, we defined what the criteria is for the audit. The scope is meant to represent and defined as the physical boundaries. Um, so that'll be we're auditing this facility, all processes within the facility. And if we go back up to Clause A, that's where the audit program comes into play. It's going to define what audits we're handling, what criteria we're applying, and the uh, scope for those audits, or what departments we're going to hit, or what uh, buildings we're going to hit at what particular time, right? Um, letter C, select auditors and conduct audits to ensure objectivity and impartiality of the audit process. So this is where we don't want to have our um, processes assessed by somebody that's executing those processes. And why not? Because nobody is going to call their own child ugly. If I was uh, involved in creating this process, if I'm involved in the execution, it may be really, really tough for me to distance myself from the ownership, from the pride factor, and, and take a true and honest look. We've heard the, the expression, the forest for the trees. This is, this is exactly what this is talking about. We want somebody to take a look from a different perspective and, and see truly what's going on, not just superficially look at it from the surface and say everything is good, but dig into the nitty-gritty and find out where it's broken nobody's perfect. Um, the next is letter D, ensure that the results of audits are reported to relevant management. Now there's two different perspectives here, and both are correct. Relevant management would be uh, the area management. Now if we remember back to the old standard, it said uh, un, uh, corrective action or correction and corrective action shall be taken by the management for the area responsible without undue delay. So the, those words have been removed. Now it says we're going to report to relevant management and letter E says take appropriate correction and corrective action. So why does it not have to be, uh, the corrective action not have to be taken by the relevant management or the area responsible's management? And there's an FAQ that clarifies, we don't necessarily care who takes the corrective action. They have to be empowered, they have to be capable, they have to be competent, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for the top dog or the boss to be involved in running the corrective action process. They absolutely have to have buy-in, they absolutely have to have awareness, and that's what bullet D represents, but do they have to be the leader of the car team? And I think we can all say that the answer is no. Uh, letter F, retain documented information as evidence of the implementation of the audit program and the audit results. So notice it's saying we need, uh, using the old term, records of the audit program being executed and those audit results. Now, do audit results mean just a report? Does it mean just a list of the nonconformities? No. It says the audit results. It's telling us we need evidence that we've executed the audit and the audit program in accordance with the program we've defined up there in letter A. So now we have to have a program that's capable of, of fully assessing the entirety of the system, and we need retained documented information to prove that it was done so that it can be reviewed later on and essentially tell the same story that the auditors saw at the time. Um, we'll talk more about all this stuff in just a few minutes. Uh, the note there says ISO 19011 can be used for guidance. And if you don't have or haven't reviewed ISO 19011, 
or if you haven't reviewed the newly released version, the 2018 version, man, I would strongly suggest you go purchase that um, or shamelessly borrow it from a friend. Um, and we'll talk – oops, it skipped that slide. There it is. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the concepts that are created by this, but for those that have been through a lead auditor course, you know that this is the foundation for – probably 20 hours of that course. So there's not much that I can do to expand on it given the short period of time we have. Uh, again, great document. It's not binding. It's not something I can audit you against. But if you're looking for best practices, if you're looking for ideas on how to strengthen your program, I would strongly suggest looking at the 1911. Uh, as it says here, it provides guidance and resources associated with the principles of the management system auditing. Um, whether you're first party, second party, or a third party audit, this is a great, great, great resource for you. Um, talks about the management of the audit programs, the different phases of the audit, and how to, to conduct those audits, whether they be internal or external, as I mentioned. Uh, and then it also talks about the competence and evaluation of auditors. Um, one of the things that, that companies struggle with is finding uh, qualified internal auditors uh, because, you know, it, it's an extra duty. It's other duty as assigned. So often that gets relegated back to the quality team. And as I'm going to discuss here, it's really tough to use just quality resources for conducting the audits for objectivity and impartiality reasons, as well as wanting to have a fresh set of eyes. If I've got the same four or five bodies doing all of the audits through the organization, at some point there's, there's going to be a little bit of uh, complacency it's human nature. So we, we have some methodology for um, bringing auditors on board and then ongoing evaluations to make sure that they're um, continuing to do what they're supposed to do. Okay, so that's 1911 in a nutshell. The other section I want to talk about is 9.3.2, uh, and this is the, the management review input section in particular. And as we know, uh, management needs to be made aware of audit results. Now, this is different than Clause 9.2.2, where it says uh, ensure that results of audits are reported to the relevant management. So this would be your functional manager, your area manager, or in some cases may be the top management group. It depends on the size and structure of your organization. This 9.3.2 is saying that we need to make sure that top management is made aware of the audit results. Now you'll note that it doesn't say internal, external, customer, supplier. It just says audit results. Why is that? In Don's humble opinion, it's because all of these are sources of data. They're data points that management can use to determine whether the system is working or not. And if we're taking a true and objective look at our system and we're finding something that's good, something that's bad, maybe something that's ugly, we can take action as a management team once we have that picture painted for us, right? So the, the input to management review is giving management an opportunity to, to candidly see whether the system is functioning or not. So with that, uh, again, that's pretty much all the citations that exist within the standard associated with the internal audit process. There's not much there to go on, but there is a ton of information or the, the connotations that this have can be pretty in-depth. Uh, 1911 is a great source of information, um, but we're going to go through some of it right now. Um, so this slide was meant to be a little funny. Uh, sorry if I missed the boat there, but it says, why do internal, or why do we do internal audits? Um, you can see the one guy saying there's always a, a huge disruption to the business. They never deliver dif the difficult message. Um, and, and sometimes we're in an organization where that's true. If our internal audit process is functioning, we can still be friends and have the candid conversation that drives the continual improvement we need, but there needs to be a management system culture. Our top management has to set the tone that it's okay for us to have issues. It's okay for us to um, discuss those touchy subjects as long as we can do it in a professional way and still remain friends. Uh, we're going to be fine. Um, we can't play the blame game. We can't look for fault. 
we need to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons and with the right uh, mentality in mind. So why do internal audits? The next slide um, says we're going to assess the effectiveness of the, the QMS or the EMS. Whatever management systems we're using, we're going to assess their effectiveness and demonstrate conformance or nonconformance through the retained documented information that's reviewed. Um, we're looking at the proof to make sure that people have done what they said they were going to do, whether it be a third party or a first party. There's no difference. We're looking to see that you guys or you're looking to see that your group has reviewed what you said you were going to do against what you did and find the disparities between. You establish processes for a reason. You want to follow those processes. And where those processes don't work, we want to take action. That's really the intent behind the internal audits. So to demonstrate compliance with your planned arrangements, whether they be the manual procedures or standard. Explore opportunities for improvement. And your internal audits will be an excellent source for this, especially if we're using qualified, competent uh, auditors, because they're going to have ideas or thoughts on how to make it better, on ways to improve. And this is a great opportunity for us to gather those items, those risks and opportunities maybe, and feed them into the system that's been outlined. Um, if we're only looking for nonconformance, or if we're only looking for conformance, we're not going to be taking advantage of that, that suggestion or that opportunity for improvement that may come up. Uh, the last two um, says meet requirements, whether it be customer statutory regulatory. Sometimes we're required by supplier quality or by a, a statutory requirement that we have to com uh, complete an internal audit. Or frankly, if you're going to go through the certification process with a certification body, you're going to have to have an internal audit program. You're going to have to execute that program. So it may be to meet that requirement. Um, or it may be a combination of that and several others here, right? And sometimes management just wants internal audits done because they have questions or they have thoughts about a particular department process, um, product line, and they want an auditor to go out and do a review to find out where the, the problems may have come from or to, to assess the situation in a little more detail. So all of these may be sources or, or reasons to do internal audits, or within your program, it may be a combination thereof. For that audit program, as it says there, the standard just says we need to plan, establish, implement, maintain the program. Now that program needs to define a few things, but we have to have defined through a plan and then we execute that plan, and then we make sure that the plan stays together or that the program stays together um, as, we, as we continue down the path of certification or of uh, compliance or conformance to our system requirements. Um, that plan or program then needs to include the frequency of audits, so how often we're going to do them, um, the methods by which we're going to audit, whether they be a checklist-based, a sample that's taken, maybe following a product, um, we're going to talk more about that here in a minute. The responsibilities associated with the audit, defining who your auditors are, uh, who's going to review the results, who's going to re be responsible for corrective actions, et cetera. Um, planning requirements, so what types of activities need to be done to prepare or plan for those audits, whether they be creating a checklist, developing a schedule and communicating it. Maybe it's a matter of sampling or pulling some packages out of the uh, the archives and, and reviewing historical data as well. And then we have to have a method for the last one here, reporting all of this information, again, to make sure that this goes back into the uh, top management's hands as well as the um, area manager's hands when we have nonconformity found. Um, it doesn't specify, doesn't specifically say within the section that we have to have a maintained documented information item. No procedure required here. But if your organization needs that, if you need it defined so that everybody that's touching this process can be on the same page, do it. Um, as you know, under the old standard, this was a required procedure. There was a required document associated with this. So if you have that as a legacy item, perfectly fine. In fact, it's, it's probably not a bad idea given the number of hands that you hopefully have involved in the audit program. Uh, is it a requirement 
as we know, it is not. Uh, the next one here is talking about planned intervals. So I'm, I'm jumping around within the clause, but there was a method to my madness here. We develop a program. The program has to be executed at planned intervals. So it doesn't tell us how frequently our audits have to be conducted. Um, it says we need to create the audit program. The program is going to define or going to define the frequency, and that's going to establish those planned intervals, right? The standards generic term for how often we're going to do our audits. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a schedule. That's been defined through clarification. So we don't, as auditors, need to see a schedule. We do, however, need to see how you define those planned intervals. So that can be within the quality manual, saying each process hit quarterly, or a one and done type approach throughout the course of the year, um, targeting July, right? That can be establishing our planned interval. Keep in mind though, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, we need to make sure that we're able to show bias towards processes that are important, um, that have changed to the process, or that are problematic, and we'll talk more about that. Um, most companies, most CBs, will require a full system every three years as a minimum. And that's what we're held to through the uh, oversight documents. Um, but every three years could be kind of difficult given the, the size of the organization, um, meaning you, you, it may be so large that hitting it more frequently than three years may be a struggle, or that you'll hit everything every year anyway, so doing it once every three years adds even less value. Um, you guys get a pick. You as an organization get a pick the frequency at which you're going to audit, but if you're in a certified position, if you're certified to a standard, um, I'd never go more than three years. Opinion-wise, I'd never go more than once a year without looking at the entirety of the system. Um, we'll talk more about my opinions surrounding that here in a little bit. Um, as a general rule, your CB is going to be required to hit a certain number of audit days, um, whether it be on the AS side where it's very, very regulated, the TS side, the automotive side, uh, IETF. It's very regulated. On the ISO side, it's, it's fairly regulated. There's a starting point, and then we have some additions and subtractions that are permitted. Either way, once you understand how many days your CB is doing, and I would throw in customer audits. If you know you're going to face a customer audit of four days, count that in the total as well. And I would strongly encourage you to be doing more audits than your CB and those known customer audits. Because if we're coming in and spending the amount of time that we're going to and catching things, and then we see that your audit is only looking at the entire system in a course of, over the course of one day and not finding things, I as an auditor need to question the integrity of your audit program or the effectiveness of your audit program. So if you're doing more days, you're bound to catch more stuff, especially if you have competent auditors. I would strongly encourage you to be doing more days than your CB and your customer audits. Um, the next slide talks about audit planning. So as I mentioned, the one and done approach or once a year approach is, is possible, it's doable. But then we need to make sure we're showing bias towards the importance, the changes, and the results of previous audits as it says there in Clause 922A. It's pretty, it can be pretty tough to demonstrate that you've taken a look at those things, the, the importance of your processes, the changes to your process and the results of previous audits, if you're only hitting each process uh, once a year and you're using the same amount of time for each of those processes. What this is saying is if my production process accounts for 90% of my labor, why would I spend the same amount of time going through that process as I would, say, my purchasing process that has two bodies? Um, we we want to make sure that we're, we're biasing towards the processes that are of most importance. Um, we're, we're looking at processes that have had significant changes or, or modifications to them, or maybe a new product has been launched, and it's something that we, we want to focus on. Um, we also need to look at the previous results and, and see if the trends are there. So if I had multiple nonconformities in an uh, internal audit from the previous year, I'm going to be looking at that process pretty in depth this year to make sure that the corrective actions were effective and hadn't bled across. Um, 
as an external auditor, as a third-party auditor, we do the same thing. As a part of the pre-planning process, I'm asking you for information surrounding who are your customers and what percentage of the business do they represent because I want to bias my sampling towards those customers that are paying your bills. I ask for your scope statement because I want to bias towards the activities that your customers are paying you for and not necessarily some of the support functions behind the scenes. We still need to look at the support functions, but we're going to focus on the areas of importance. We're also going to look at changes. So if you're modifying your scope of registration or you've added additional capabilities or processes, you can guarantee that's something we're going to look at. Uh, in addition, everybody here knows the results of previous audits are reviewed at every single audit. We're looking at the nonconformities from the previous audits every single time. And in addition to that, most auditors keep their notes from the previous year. So we can go back and look at those problematic areas or things that didn't quite make sense and do some follow-up associated with that just to make sure that there haven't been any negative trends or negative changes associated with your audit program. The next slide talks about selection of auditors. Now, I think this is probably one of the more important aspects of the audit program. Um, not everybody can audit. Anybody can fill out a checklist. But to truly add value and to truly audit, we need to find somebody that's not going to strike fear in the the folks that they're interviewing. They've got to be personable. They also need to be somewhat tenacious to make sure that they're not going to just let sleeping dogs lie. In the internal audit setting, when, when we find something and the management or the supervisor over the area says, no, don't worry about that, um, frankly, that, that's indicative of some cultural problems, I believe, uh, or can be, but it also puts the auditor in a, a really uncomfortable situation because their job is to dig. Their job is to make that ethical action towards driving the improvement. So they need to be somewhat tenacious. They need to be educated as well to make sure that they're able to understand where the value comes in digging in and not necessarily sticking to their guns when it's, you know, something that's silly or non-value added. Uh, and that's where your audit program manager, your, your team leaders are going to come in and hopefully clarify things, right? Um, but the auditors need to, as a general rule, need to be objective and impartial for the area, and they need to have some skills associated with being good communicators. They need to have the third bullet there says ethical, tenacious, personable, fair, effective communicator, because we need to establish a rapport with the person we're interviewing, and we need to ensure that we're getting the information out of them effectively and digesting that information such that it's going to add value to the organization. If we're getting a bunch of information as auditors and it's going in one ear and out the other, or we're missing the, the uh, critical aspects of that conversation, not necessarily digging in on where we should be digging, um, it's not going to be as effective. Okay? So how do we define who can be an auditor? And really the answer is it depends. Competency, as the second bullet says, is is to an internally defined criteria. So you guys get to determine what competence is for your auditors. Um, some companies require that external lead auditor training. Some companies require the AATT training that all of us have to go through uh, as third-party auditors. Some simply do a job shadow type training, and any of those are fine as long as you can demonstrate the effectiveness of the program and you've got some documented information or records to show that the auditor has met the definition of competency. So if you've said they're going to be job shadowing, we've got some evidence to show that they've job shadowed that qualified or competent auditor for long enough to meet the requirements or the definition of competency associated with your auditor. Um, I would, there, there's not a, a standard requirement for this, but I would strongly encourage some basic training associated with auditing skills. And again, 1911 is a phenomenal source of information for what those auditors should know and the skills. In fact, that the third bullet, the ethical, tenacious, personable, fair, effective communicator, all of that stuff comes right out of 1911. Um, 
there's a whole bunch more that's in there. That's just the stuff that I, I grabbed and wanted to talk about here in particular. Um, the last bullet I put up there is a consideration for you. Um, really what we're looking for are the weaknesses, the opportunities to make our company better. And if we're using those internal customers, they have a good understanding of where the handoffs are from their internal supplier to their process. So if we're using them to assess their internal supplier, meaning my production person is maybe or production um, resource is being used to audit my stores department, they have an understanding of what needs to come out to the next process, and they can maybe take a little more refined look at it versus putting someone out there that has no recollection or no involvement in that process. Um, in addition, using those internal customers can help to ensure that the information exchange is there and we're not creating waste. Because if I go into stores and start doing the, the uh, audit in there as, as a member of the production team, and I see that stores is creating a report that they're including and nobody in the production area is using it, we can identify that as an opportunity to eliminate some wasted labor and, and really drive some more continual improvement within our system. So something to consider there for sure. Um, no matter what or who we use for the internal audit process, we want to make sure that they're informed. Um, I, for those that have been through an audit with me, you've heard me use the term the skeletons are buried. And, and as it relates to auditing, I want the internal auditors to be writing nonconformities. They know where the skeletons are buried within the organization. They know where the problems are. They know where the the troubled spots are, they go take an objective and impartial look at those buried skeletons, they identify what's broken, and then they drive corrective action. Um, from a selfish standpoint, standpoint, that makes my life a lot easier because now I don't have to write a nonconformity. It makes your life a lot easier because you don't have to respond to a CB nonconformity, nor do you have to respond to a customer escape or a customer problem that's been possibly developed as a result of that. So something to consider, using those informed or involved people associated with the audits because they're going to have more ownership, more um, knowledge associated with what uh, should be or what the expected outcomes are. As far as methods go, a lot of verbiage here. Um, we're looking for conformance to the requirements of the standard, whether they be, again, internal requirements, customer statutory regulatory requirements. Uh, no matter what, we need to make sure that our evidence evidence clearly demonstrates conformance or nonconformance to those requirements, right? So it's not a matter of putting a C in a checklist or a check in a checklist. It's a matter of writing down the documents, the records, the jobs, the work orders that we reviewed or the product numbers that we reviewed to make sure that we can prove that it was done or that, you know, provide the evidence that it was done. Um, one of the things third-party auditors get as a part of the oversight process is uh, some of our stakeholders, um, namely Boeing at this point, they'll grab one of our third-party audit packages and they'll go visit companies. They'll, they'll recreate our audit looking at the same evidence that we've cited and they'll review our evidence to make sure that um, our auditor had an effective and acceptable conclusion as a result of their review of that evidence. So the ability for them to recreate our audit is important. It's no different than what we're looking for as third-party auditors. We want to see through your internal audit records or documented information that you've done an effective dive of your system and found stuff that was bad. And if you can show me that you've looked at these jobs, you found no problems, or that you looked at these jobs and you found some problems and you took effective corrective action, we're all going to be better off. A um, couple different types of audits here, uh, different methods or different ways that we can do the audits at planned intervals. Um, process, product, and system. And again, this information comes right out of 1911, but there's a couple other, and excuse me, and there are a couple other options there, but these are the three main ones we talk about. So the process-focused audit or process-based audit is reviewing the inputs, activities, and outputs of the process. So we're looking at a process from start to finish. We may be sampling a few different products or a few different jobs as we go through that, but what it does, the benefit that it provides is 
a more effective look at the handoffs or the interfaces maybe within the process from department to department or from process to process because we're really focused on following that all the way through and touching a lot of the activities within that process. Um, another type is the product audit, and that's where you follow a product or a type of product from start to finish, from maybe concept to, to grave, and, and look at all of the activity that's occurred on that. Obviously, that can be a very timely audit, or excuse me, a very time-consuming audit, rather. Um, but it also is pretty effective in looking at it from the customer's perspective, because we're looking to see did the, the end requirements get fulfilled and have those requirements be uh, been translated all the way down through the organization. Uh, the last is the system audit, more encompassing. Um, I, put in there that it can be too much to review at once um, because this is where we're looking at the entirety of the system. We're not necessarily focused on the nitty gritty detail as much depending on how it's been divided up. So what's the right answer as to how to do the audits? Uh, again, commentary wise, I think it's a, a combination thereof. Um, a lot of organizations will do that annual system audit. They'll supplement it with some process audits, maybe a layered process audit type approach. Um, and then supplement that even with some product audits depending on the customers. Some customers are mandating bench audits or workstation audits as well as product-centric audits where you're looking at all of those aspects of the certain product lines um, annually. So it's a combination, but you, and you've got to find what works for you, but I, I really do think there's value in all of these different types of audits. Um, as far as reporting goes, I'm going to go through some typical examples, but not required types, okay? So the typical report package will consist of a schedule or some plan, something that's the, telling the team, here's what we're going to do. Now, keep in mind, all three of these different bullets here could be on the same piece of paper. They could be in the same document, but they have a very distinct purpose um, for each type, okay? So the audit plan or the schedule is going to provide the details of intent, who we're going to talk to, what we're going to audit, um, where we're going to start, and then we're going to let the audit trails go from there. Um, the checklist. So whether you use a checklist or you have the, the copy of the standard memorized, um, whatever you choose to do, the checklist can be beneficial because it, it provides a repository for the auditor to capture the evidence of conformance and nonconformance to the requirements, to the clauses. Um, I, would, I would strongly encourage you, as that bullet says, make sure it's built on the standard, not just a few predictable questions. Because if we built it on a few predictable questions and we're using the same checklist over and over and over, uh, it may really limit how deep the dive is associated with the audit. If we're building it on the standard, we're allowing the auditors the freedom to go ask those questions, to go dig in and use the gray matter between their ears, it's going to be a very effective audit. And then we simply use the checklist as a means of capturing the objective evidence and telling the story associated with what they looked at. Now, the other, the other bullet I put there is make sure it's tailored to the area or process being audited. Uh, and the cautionary tale I'll tell you is if you hand them the full checklist or the full standard, um, there may come a time, and I I'm, have great confidence that a few clients are laughing about this, but there may come a time where one of your auditors is going to miss a particular section. So now if you miss a section through the entirety of the year, have you truly followed your program, which defines an annual audit? Uh, and the answer would be no. You haven't assessed the entirety of the standard or the entirety of your system on an annual basis if an auditor failed to uh, put evidence of conformance within the checklist. And it could be a matter of confusion, right? So if we tailor it or if we pare down the requirements that are not applicable to the area, and now the auditor has to provide evidence of conformance or nonconformance associated with each of the items on the checklist, you're probably going to be less likely to um, miss some clauses through the course of the year or the, the course of your program. The last item that I've got listed there is the report. Um, and really the report is for, for management, for the, the 
the purpose of providing that executive summary of the issues, telling the story in a concise manner so that we can communicate all is well or we found these things and we need to fix a couple things. So it's going to be digested within the management team. That's the target audience of that audit report. We need to make sure that it's written such that it tells the story of what we found so that resources can be allocated to drive the necessary improvements to fix it, whether it be through corrective action or some other method, uh, continual improvements, risks and, out, or risks and opportunities, whatever. We need to make sure that we're telling a compelling story so that management can take appropriate action. Um, I wanted to go through just a brief example here. Um, again, I'm not suggesting that this is what you're going to do. I'm not suggesting that this is a great process, but this is something that, that is an amalgamation of what I see at companies that have a good handle on their internal audit program. So back to my, my previous slide that talked about um, the basic components here, the schedule, the checklist, and the report. Here is your schedule or your plan. So this is the program that's defining who's going to be audited, what they're going to be audited against, the criteria, and we're looking at the status and importance, okay? We're looking at previous nonconformities, and by the way, the status or the risk level there can also include the, uh, not just the status and importance, but we could use that as a means to factor in the uh, changes, right? And I'm, again, you, you come up with your own criteria here. Somehow you need to be able to show that you've biased towards those areas that are important to your business and that um, are maybe problematic to your business. So having a tool like this helps to tell that story. More importantly, it helps you to understand where the problem areas are so you can allocate the right resources to going and conducting the audits. Um, if I don't have something like this, it's all hearsay. It's all subjective. And then it's really tough for me to understand where my, my problematic areas are um, reliably, objectively. So something like this helps to tell that story, helps me to justify the need for resources, the need for the audits, and to go ahead and execute them. And then it also tells me when those audits are to be conducted roughly, right? Um, you're going to see some, some commentary on this later on. Um, but it's really important that we execute to those, and management is going to play an absolutely paramount role in ensuring that these audits get executed, whether it be through establishing priority, whether it be allocating time, whatever. We've got to have buy-in from top management to make sure that this program is, one, approved from the get-go, and, two, executed um, on an ongoing basis or maintained, as the standard calls it, Otherwise, we're not going to get the bang for the buck out of the program. So we've got our audit schedule, our audit plan, our audit program, whatever we want to call this, something establishing what we're going to audit. And we use that checklist associated with demonstrating conformance within each of those clauses. Um, the, the clauses are the shall statements. Now, you can go to this depth if you'd like. This is what our report package from the third-party side used to include um, back in the 9101D era called the OER, the Objective Evidence Record. The OER was a great tool for auditors that didn't necessarily have an a in-depth understanding of the requirements, right? For auditors that had that understanding, it became a, a chore because we fill out these pairs, and then we had to go back and plug the data into the OER. Or we would do the OER that's very clause-centric, and then we would fill out the pairs that are very process-based. So it was definitely looking at things from a different perspective. Um, but it did, it did provide an assurance that we were doing a complete audit as long as those OERs were filled out completely and correctly. Um, the pair is a wonderful tool and one that I think some auditors will argue about. But I think it's a wonderful tool that helps us to understand as auditors and you as a client, what do we do? What do we need to do it? Sorry, let me get my mouse cursor here. So what do we do? What do we need to do it? What do we produce as a result? And who do we need to talk to while we're doing that? So if we can tell the story of what we do, what we need, what we make, or what we produce, and who we interface with, 
man, we're going to be successful at, at demonstrating the, that the process is executed correctly, right? Now, the other half of a pair, as we all know, is are we executing the correct things? Are we doing the right things? And that's where the KPIs come in or the, the process performance measures. So are we doing things that matter? If we're looking at our KPIs or our quality objectives and we're seeing that the, the numbers are responding in a positive manner, we have better confidence that our activities are appropriate. If our KPIs, our on-time delivery is, is struggling, as an example, and we see that we're doing the same things over again, it really isn't beneficial to us, um, and we need to take a different look at it, right? So we use both aspects, both pieces of this, the process results and the process realization, to determine whether or not the process is effective. So the way we fill this out is we describe the activities up here, and then down here we're going to cite the specific job numbers, the specific work orders, documents, et cetera, that we look at, the, the audit trails and the evidence that we reviewed to help demonstrate conformance or nonconformance of this process. This is not a form that I would recommend clients using or companies to use in its entirety, but the principle behind it is excellent in my opinion. And, and if you can incorporate something like this tailored to your organization's needs, I think you're going to see a lot of bang for your buck out of your audit program. Regardless of what you're using, we need to make sure that we're creating uh, an audit trail or, or documenting the audit trail, creating a trail of evidence so that somebody reviewing it after the fact can understand what you looked at, why you looked at it, and why you came to the conclusions that you arrived at. Um, moving on to the next slide here, almost done. A couple of commentary items, and I'll uh, let Mike get a couple minutes here to take his phone off mute um, while I go through these last couple slides, and then he can provide his input as well. Um, so as far as commentary or summary, I guess, we've got to have management involved. Management has to be involved and they really have to buy into the program because if, if this truly is just a quality function and management could care less, we're not going to get the support. We're not going to see the improvements. We're not going to get the priority that the audit program needs. And we're probably not going to be getting input from our, um, from our auditees. We're not going to get good feedback that's going to help drive that internal audit, or excuse me, that, that continual improvement. Um, and, and really, in, in my work or my opinion, that, that is a, a definition of complacency. If, if we're not driving the improvement because we have a lack of buy-in or a lack of involvement, we're, we're really complacent to the, the need for continual improvement. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing as a part of these, these quality management system or environmental, environmental management system standards. Uh, second bullet. Audits should be throughout the year, repeating audits of critical and problematic processes. You can do the one and done approach if you, if you choose to, that's perfectly fine. But uh, again, commentary wise, I really, really think a more frequent look and smaller snapshots is beneficial. Um, I do see value in maybe the once a year doing a complete checklist, making sure that everything has been hit, but maybe more periodic looks of smaller chunks of process-based or product-based or workstation audits throughout the course of the year um, because if we're waiting till the end of the year for reviewing our system, it's probably a little too late to make those changes. If we're reviewing it more frequently, we can, we can really take action before it becomes a problem, before it manifests into a customer-facing issue or regulatory issue. So. I would strongly encourage you to divide up any of those annual audit programs, make them more frequent, make them smaller chunks, um, define a program that works for you guys, but also adds value. The next slide talks to not being afraid to find stuff. We would hope as an external auditors, and I'm sure every one of them on this call would say, I want you to find it in the internal audit process, because if you find it, we don't have to, your customer doesn't have to, and it doesn't become a, a bad product going out the door. That's really the overall goal here. 
if you find it, write it. Create a corrective action. Take action through the system. Um, you can't get better if you don't know that it's broken. And oftentimes those auditors may be inclined to just say that's the way we've always done it. But, you know, if they're not writing it, even though that's the way it's always been done, it's not going to get better. Um, again, that's where a fresh set of eyes comes into play as well. Uh, no benefit from soft grading. For those that don't know the definition, soft grading is when we, not, uh, we find something that's bad, but we don't call it bad. And it could be for political reasons. It could be for fear reasons, or it could just because um, out of ignorance. If, if it's bad, call it bad. Take action. Don't be afraid of corrective actions. Corrective actions are your tool to make your system better. They're not necessarily a derogatory or a, um, a penalty, right? It's not, a, it's not meant to penalize your, your organization. These are meant to help drive that continual improvement through a, a very refined and, and robust methodology for improvement. Um, select auditors that will provide the most value. They've got to be objective, tenacious, personable, and informed. We want them to find the skeletons in the closet. Again, find them before they become customer problems, CD problems, or product problems. Um, I love this quote as well. If you can't get rid of the skeletons in your closet, teach them to dance. If we can't get rid of them, let's expose them and make them work for us. Okay? And last but not least, make sure our reports tell the story demonstrate the conformance or nonconformance. Um, we got to make sure that we're painting the picture so that someone else can look at it, recreate your audit trails or your thoughts and conclusions. Uh, for those that know, I mean, Bob Ross was a wonderful. He painted this using only the color orange. And uh, I'm just kidding on that aspect. But he, he does a wonderful job at painting a picture and telling a story. And we want to make sure that we're painting that picture within the audit report so that it can be reviewed later on and somebody can understand it. So Mike, this is your opportunity to uh, share your thoughts as well. Well, well, first of all, can you hear me? Because my sound system isn't always up to snuff. Yep, gotcha. Okay, I don't have a lot to say. Don covered it extremely well, and again, I'm not surprised. But the two key areas, and if you've been on any of these other webinars recently, we click on culture and improvement a lot. Culture is so key. One can drive the other, one should drive the other. If you have a, a management set up where it, maybe you feel the culture is not conducive to you getting this done well, and you say, well, it's kind of hopeless. I can't, if, if my upper management doesn't support me, there's not much I can do. But through the improvement tool, which, by the way, the end result of these internal audits should be findings, okay? If you look at the standard section 10, corrective actions are called, in, they're under the improvement section. They're an improvement tool. When you can show your management the improvements you've made by using those tools, you're going to get a buy-in a lot quicker than if you're just song and dancing them. So culture, improvement, they're key. You build the right culture, and you can help build that culture even if you're not upper management. Trust me, because people will see your lead. They'll follow what you do if it's working. You can help establish that culture. You can help convince your upper management that that's the culture that needs to be there. Improvements will follow. That's really, really all I wanted to say. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And, and going along with Mike's point, it's no accident that I chose this graphic for the slide. Um, for our transition slide because management and quality are hand in hand. If we don't have the right management culture, the right management system put together, it's going to be really tough for us to sustain quality of people, quality of product, quality of system. We've got to make sure that all of that is clicking and management is absolutely paramount in making sure that happens. So I'm going to answer some questions. This is the point where I'm going to allow you to type those questions into the feedback section. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to go through, or while you're doing that, rather, I'm going to go through some of our resource options and offerings. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, first one is the NSF ISR resources page. So this one is, uh, you can see, available from the nsf.org backslash info backslash ISO-updates. 
And then if you click on the little panel there associated with AS9100 2016, whether you're 9100, 9110, or 9120, or frankly, if you're an ISO company, whether it be 9000 or 14 or, or 45, doesn't matter to me, all of our webinars are available in that, are on that page. You click on that webinar series link down below, and you'll see a, a hyperlink for going to download those. Um, go in there, grab them. They're free. Uh, you have to enter your contact information to get them. And that's only so Katie can get you on our mailing list. Um, that's really all we're using that for. So please feel free to use those. The other, op or, uh, the other tool I'll share with you relevant to this topic is on that same page, you'll find a document called the Internal Audit Tool. And I've mentioned this in the past, but it's probably more relevant today because of our conversation surrounding this checklist. So this is actually a screenshot of the internal audit tool that's available free for download from our website. Um, feel free to customize it, take it, modify it, do whatever you got to do to make it work for your organization. There's nothing proprietary about it. Um, I will say that the commentary on the tool is absolutely correct. It is not a standalone checklist. It's got to be used to supplement the audit program, just as I mentioned in the, uh, the discussions earlier. Okay. Um, the other source of information that I'll point you to is the IAQG website. The IAQG website is available at sae.org backslash IAQG, or if you Google IAQG, it should come up to that as well. A um, couple different resources here. One is tied to the Supply Chain Management Handbook. Again, if you haven't perused that, do it. It's awesome. There's a lot of great resources in there on any topic you can think of, whether you're an AS company or not. It is a free resource. You do have to sign up for a username um, within the Supply Chain Management Handbook, but one of the absolute best tools you'll find um, surrounding just a, a single point of contact or single source for all sorts of information related to management systems. The other one is uh, more centric to the uh, standards, the IAQG standards, or even the ISO 9001 standard. Um, click on that uh, standard questions uh, box there. It'll take you to a matrix of all the different standards that they support. And from there, you can uh, find the FAQs, the clarification document, or any other tools that you want. Um, all my clients know that I, I preach the importance of a document in the 9100 page called the evaluation guidance material. I've mentioned it several times through our webinars. Again, it's under the 9100 support materials. You can get to it either through the standard questions um, box and click on the uh, 9100 or if you click directly onto that one, it'll take you there. It's the document called evaluation guidance material. It's centered around providing third-party auditors uh, some, some insight as to what each clause means and the types of evidences that we should see. Now, if I'm training new resources for internal auditing, it is a great Reader's Digest, Cliff's Notes training tool that can be given to those auditors or used to supplement the training of those auditors to really make them more effective at auditing. So certainly consider that resource. Um, with that said, I'm going to go look at some questions and read those. While I'm doing that, I'm going to leave it on this slide. And this is our contact information for, for Mike and myself. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. We're here to support you. Uh, we want to make sure that you're successful through the process. We'll give you any support we can. Um, feel free to email us at any time. Okay? So questions that we have or that have come in here. Uh, first one, how, or excuse me, would this audit reporting need to be altered at all for 14,000 or will it work for all ISO standards? Now, my question, or my, my statement back to you is auditing methodologies from 1911 are universal. What changes is the criteria. So what may change is our checklist content the requirements that are listed within that checklist, as well as the requirements that are tied to each process. But the way we collect evidence, the way we report that evidence, the way we write nonconformities should be universal for all of the management system standards. 
Um, Follow-up question to that, how to ensure all elements are audited at each location of strictly process audit, suggestions for staff that are hesitant to this and still assigning by element numbers, each element being audited separately. So I'm going to point back to this resource here, and I'll come back to our contact information in a moment, but that's where this tool comes in. So we've identified what our processes are, and we identify here what the clauses are for each of those processes. So this provides us a tool that links process to clause, and now we have the ability to build a checklist that is tied to each one of those processes. Um, this also helps to ensure that we're looking at everything because now we've identified all of the clauses in one source versus looking through checklists for each one of those processes. So this audit program or the audit plan is going to be instrumental in identifying that. It's going to save you a lot of rework on the back end. Okay? If that didn't answer your question, let me know and I'll try again. Let me go back to this slide. And the next question comes from Sven. It says, the, uh, do I need to complete a pair for the core processes? Now, the official answer I'll tell you is, as a client organization, you do not have to complete a pair ever. Um, that is the auditor's responsibility. However, if you can't help them and complete some of the information in there, it really makes me question whether or not you have an understanding of your process. But you do not need to. That is the auditor's responsibility to fill it out as a part of the audit process uh, for the third-party audit. Um, now, on the internal audit side, you don't have to if you're going to supplement your, your processes or your audit process with the pair. Um, you certainly don't have to. Uh, it's a tool, but it's uh, on, on our side, we don't use it for non-product realization processes. It's only used for those that touch product realization. Um, again, it, it's a great tool. It's just something you've got to define for your organization as to whether or not it's um, meaningful to you. Uh, next question comes from my friend Jane. Uh, Ms. Jane says, I think it was the OASIS database that had a wonderful internal audit template for Rev C. Any news on something similar for Rev D? Um, the tool I believe you're thinking of is the OER. Uh, that's where we, we created that checklist that's available from our website, the internal audit tool it's called. Um, feel free to download that if you want to put it into an Excel format. You can right now with the Word document. Um, modify the columns to make it work for your organization. Whatever you want to do, it's there for you. Uh, next from Greg, if you pick or if you're from a small organization, six to ten people, how picky should one get when selecting the audit team? Um, Greg, great question. A lot of companies that we face are going to be in that smaller size. And, and my thought process is uh, grab a couple of the key stakeholders, and it's probably going to be management personnel in that case. Or I can guarantee a lot of our third-party auditors, that's what they do when they're not working for CBs, is they go conduct internal audits for organizations like that, um, just to make sure it's an unbiased or independent and objective view of the system. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for you to consult with um, somebody that has the credentials to do the auditing, but if they do your internal audit, obviously for objectivity reasons, they're not going to do your, your third-party audits. Okay? Uh, Another comment here from my own experiences, very old school manufacturing organizations only do audit for certification purposes. Man, I'd agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, see a lot of organizations, probably organizations that aren't on this call because they're not necessarily interested in driving the improvement, uh, but they, they do the audits only because the CB or the certification requires it. Um, it. They're not getting the gain, they're not getting the bang for their buck out of the system that they should be. And it really is their loss. Eventually, it's going to burn them uh, because they're not going to be able to sustain or maintain the culture needed to drive the continual improvement and, and keep certification or keep their customers happy. Um, so, yeah, it'll, it'll come full circle for them. Last question that I've got so far from Sergio, still wondering how to make management take serious responsibility on internal audit compliance. Shall I make regularly tracking charts regular calls, regularly, regular meetings, ideas. 
Um, all of those are great ideas. Uh, obviously, through the management review process, it's uh, going to be discussed. Um, a lot of the resources you look at on the Internet are going to say management's got to be involved in the creation of and the implementation and the maintenance of the audit program. Top management, president, CEO, whomever it is, has to buy into it. If not, you're going to be facing the situation that you're describing here. Um, and if you're already in that situation, uh, maybe it's a matter of, of exposing the weakness through the audit process and, and having that candid conversation or um, volunteering that information to your auditor and letting the third party guy be the bad guy. You'd be surprised how often that happens. Um, frankly, from the third party side, culture of non um, of non involvement from the top management is pretty apparent when we when we come in. Um, a lot of times we can see that we can understand um, how involved management is. And, and we, we take note of that. And we write nonconformities accordingly. So um, other ways to do it could include your uh, reviewing the findings, reviewing the audit program with the managers um, as a part of a, a weekly management meeting or your production meetings or whatever it might be. Just put it more in their face. Make sure that everybody's involved and aware uh, with the, the audit process. And really, as you know, anytime you, you do stuff like this, you got to get gains. You got to show gains. You got to show improvement. If you're not able to show some quick wins, um, you're probably not going to sustain the effort. So it's important to find a couple key wins or a couple quick wins that you can really sell people on to make them want to be involved in the audit process, to make them understand the value of the audit process. Uh, next question, how can you properly showcase the follow-up and corrective action for a major nonconformance that you find during your internal audit? Uh, great, great question. Um, I'll give you editorial feedback here. I personally hate, I shouldn't say hate, hate the strong word. I dislike the use of major and minor on the internal audit side. Um, bad is bad. We take corrective action against bad. Calling it major versus minor on the internal side Really, all it does, unless you have a different escalation path internally, all it's doing is creating some political turmoil that you probably don't need or some drama that you don't need. Um, the, the standard's pretty clear on how we take action against problems through defining the problem, correction, root cause, corrective action, verification of effectiveness. As long as you're doing that, whether it's major or minor, it's really immaterial. Um, if you do have a major category, it's a matter of making sure that your internal audit, or excuse me, your uh, effectiveness verification protocols define how you're going to do that. Whether it be through, um, whether it be through the um, initial 30-day, 60-day, 90-day ongoing review, or you know, a one-and-done type review at 90 days, or whatever it might be. You got to have a defined method associated with how you're going to verify effectiveness, and then then execute to that. Um, leave it at that for now. Uh, absolutely, you can reach out to me at any time, Sven or anybody. If you have any questions, um, email or phone call. I can't guarantee I'm going to answer my phone, but um, usually involved in some meetings and whatnot. But I'd be happy to. Uh, could you please reshow info for the NSF tool? Absolutely, the NSF tool is available from our nsf.org backslash info backslash ISO updates. Um, and then if you go to that AS9100 2019 tab, and it may not look exactly like this, but you should be able to navigate to that portion of it. If you scroll down on the body of that, there will be a link to the internal audit tool. Uh, it's a Word document you can download, grab it whenever you want. Um, my external surveillance audit is coming up in two weeks. I got hit with a curveball. Schedule says that we will be auditing our second shift of manufacturing, and my internal audit only showcases my first shift. What do I do? Um, well, I guess your, your two options are to audit your second shift or let it be. Um, from a third-party side, we are required to hit every shift when a uh, process spans those shifts, and most definitely at every recertification audit, research audit, or initial audit, we're required to hit all shifts. 
So if your production operation occurs on shifts one and two, we're going to hit shifts one and two, or we should be hitting shifts one and two. If you have operations that exist on three shifts at research, we absolutely have to hit all three shifts at research. Um, and that's a great, great point as you're doing your internal audit program. Don't just bias it towards the day shift, towards the folks that see that all the time. Let's, let's make sure we're sharing the love, sharing it with people that are going to be um, executing the process because maybe there's different situations or different scenarios that are encountered on second shift. I can tell you in a past life when I worked second shift, we didn't have nearly the engineering support. There was me and one other guy to support 500 people. So it became really problematic to get the answers we needed. We put product on hold a lot more, um, exercised some facets of our process that weren't utilized on the day shift time. So uh, consider, certainly consider building that into your program. Uh, again, you can bias it towards the importance of the process, the status of the process, and, and maybe reduce sampling or reduce date durations on the second shift given the number of bodies that are there, but definitely want to consider that. Great point. Um, and then the last question that I have up here right now, major versus minor nonconformance is uh, is not a definition needed within the audit system. From the uh, first party audits, and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong on this aspect, there is nothing that I am aware of that requires internal audits to be major and minor dependent. Um, I would strongly encourage you not to use majors and minors unless you have a different escalation path for those, meaning majors have to go to corporate governance versus minors go through just a local governance process. Um, but really within a, a smaller organization, and I'm saying anything under maybe 300 people, uh, Majors versus minors, all it does is create a political turmoil um, because of past experience coming out here. If I called it a major, they're going to encourage me to call it a minor because they had a bonus tied to a major. Um, and really all I care about is it gets fixed. So whether we call it a major or a minor is immaterial. We're going to execute the corrective action the same way. Okay. Last question now is, is do internal audits have to cover all shifts? Um, personal opinion, it's in your best interest to do it. Again, I know of no requirement for it to be done, but you do have to develop a program that defines your methods, and one of those may include the touching of additional shifts or extra shifts. If they're executing the process, I, I guess it would be a question of why aren't you doing internal audits on multiple shifts? Um, because they're, they're still doing the same job. Uh, they have different variables perhaps because the support staff isn't as prevalent on those off shifts. So maybe it's worth looking into. And maybe the data is going to drive you um, to, to find out that second shift is better or worse than your primary shift or first shift because of the support staff or because of you know, some best practice that they're doing on that shift. So it's an opportunity for you to understand and really analyze some data that, that may be beneficial to your organization in the long run. Mike, anything to add, sir? That's the last question I've got here. Mike, to jump off for another call down, so I think that he's all set. Oh, perfect. Um, well, everybody, thanks again for joining us. Uh, as Katie mentioned, we're going to have the uh, recording and the PowerPoint PDF out to you within a, about a week. Katie's usually pretty quick about that. Um, if you have any questions, any questions at all, again, my contact information is listed here. Mike's contact information is listed there. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're here to help. We're here to support you. We'd love to, uh, to, to provide whatever we can. If you have ideas for future topics, please let us know. Um, we're happy to help. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us.